Rini, we're running a little bit late, but I wanted okay. to bring you in and, and let you say hi real quick and, and make sure you know how much we appreciate and value the work you're doing at HAM. Um, would you mind just doing a just a real quick, you know, 90 seconds on, on HAM and how you guys are doing in Austin and, and just sort of what the, uh, you know, what the what the headlines are for what's going on right now in, in your Sure. Career? Sure. And Michael, thanks for doing this. And Peter, thanks for getting everybody together in the first place, you know, a couple of months ago. I think it's a really exciting thing for our nation. And certainly nothing more timely. Our whole music community has been decimated and the work that our organizations do is more vital than ever. Um, Ham is probably no different than anybody else. You know, we're all still figuring out and reeling and trying to figure out, you know, um, what we need to be doing as an organization in the right now and what we need to be doing to survive. Um, I think you probably all know our model. Um, a lot of what uh, uh, Denise was talking about is, is based on our model. We are in the process of evaluating um, kind of where we think Austin is. Of course, because South by was canceled, so close to COVID, it was really extra disastrous for the music community here because so much of our music community counts on, you know, two or three or four months of income during that that two week period or three week period. Um, Ham is probably looking at about a million dollar loss in revenues and donations so far. Um, and we are looking at ways to write grants and try to get partnerships to um, uh, make that up. And I think probably the biggest thing that I would say is our message has been to our city leaders and our hospital leaders and our healthcare leaders is um, we've tried to keep messaging in on the value that HAM brings to our community because we support these 2,600 musicians um, with over $12 million of value in healthcare a year. Um, if they don't have HAM, they're gonna be at risk and be back in a system with nothing. Right. And then we've been driving home again, the economic impact that music and live music has on Austin and how critical it is. And so hopefully our city and some of the funds that have come in, you know, we're hopefully lobbying to get some of those funds towards live music and towards musicians. No, that's, thank you, Rini, that's, that's so great. And Alex has put the link, uh, you know, into, um, so people can go to the website. Sure. More about and I apologize so much for being late. Oh, no, no, it totally happens. And, and no, we, we just, we, we so value your leadership and, you know, again, not to be a broken record, but it's just so, you know, important to see the kind of organic, locally based, locally rooted, you know, nonprofit infrastructure that has grown up around all these different subsegments of the music ecology and how then again, they, they, they grow in power by inspiring other organizations um, by supporting, you know, artists and, and our music workers. And ideally, collectively, we're all working towards a better future um, that we hopefully have agency over what that looks like, you know, and that's why we all do this work is like we can engage in the moment and we can also say we need better and how do we, again, get from here to there. So, Rini, we'll, we'll bring you back uh, for a longer Absolutely. conversation at your, at your convenience, but um, I'd, if you can hang on for a minute, we've got sure. a, a previous HAM beneficiary, Martin Perna, is with us and and uh, there you are. Martin is joining us from Oakland. For those of you who don't know Martin, he is a musician, he's a composer, he's an educator, he's an activist. Um, he is a global citizen who has basically lived the Music Cities conversation for the last couple decades, um, living in Brooklyn, living in Austin, uh, now living in the Bay Area, he has seen firsthand what it means to be a music city and what cities can do uh, to be in support of their community or not. Martin, why don't you just quickly tell your story about uh, how Ham came to your assistance a couple of years ago. Uh, hi, everybody. Denise, Peter, Alex, Eric, uh, Rini, Michael, thanks for having me here. Uh, I was living in Austin after moving down there from New York in, let's see, um, the end of 20, 2005 to 2012. And that was one of the reasons why I moved there because <laughs> New York was a dangerous place. Um, you know, I was, I had been living on like 200 bucks a month um, or, or, or a rent that was 200 bucks a month, like a tiny room, my money under a, a futon and <laughs> being, working as a bike messenger when I wasn't doing um, music. And I was just constantly worried, you know, I stopped doing all these things that were, healthy to me because I was worried that I would get hurt. <laughs> I didn't want that to happen anymore, but I didn't have money for healthcare. Um, you know, I think it represents such a, to get on any kind of a plan when you don't have a big employer represents such a huge part of 
uh, an artistic worker's income. So that was one of the big draws, that, and I had some music uh, friends down there. Shout out to all the Brownout, Grupo Fantasma folks. And um, it was just that security of knowing that I could live and not go out and go bungee jumping every day, but live a normal life. Or if I, you know, fell off a stage or, you know, messed up my back lifting an amp or, you know, anything that there, I wouldn't be hit with the worst case scenario. (laughs) And I didn't expect anybody to sort of pamper me or be able to get, you know, liposuction or anything for free. But like, it really, it really came through. There was one time when I was um, canvassing for Obama in 2008 during the primaries and I was on a scooter. I got chased by these pit bulls. Um, I smashed into a utility pole and messed up a bunch of my ribs and the scooter. And um, Ham helped me, you know, they helped me navigate Go to the ER, we'll help you work it out. And at the end of the day, the bill was maybe 350 bucks compared to, you know, it could have been in the thousands if I was paying full price. Um, they also helped me get great dental care. To this day, it's, it's actually better, the dentist that I had there in Austin, than the dental care that I had through my wife's UC Berkeley healthcare plan. So they did such a good job. Um, you know, it was really supportive. I didn't take advantage of SIMS, which was the sort of affiliated uh, mental health and addiction counseling services, but a lot of people did. And as a musician, I was really proud to uh, be part of, you know, the benefits every year. And and Ham was, so many of my friends um, in Austin are still part of that. And that's really been, you know, a, a pillar, particularly as the music industry, our means of income has gone down as records, you know, as the sales of physical products have gone down, streaming doesn't put the same amount of money in our pocket. So we have to go out on the road and that's a riskier thing. It's something that beats up the body a lot more. Mm -hmm. And um, these uh, local based healthcare, you know, kind of beautiful stopgap organizations are, are so crucial. And you see they become magnets for the cities in which they exist. And we can you know, I don't know how much has been talked about in the series about just how how many dollars one dollar spent on live music represents. But they're part of that because if you're not healthy, you can't go up on stage. You know, you're not inspired to write songs. You're too busy hooked up to a machine or coughing or you know bedridden. So it's 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 really beautiful to see um, these things happening. Uh, these organizations surviving, thriving, and then also pivoting in this moment, being so dynamic. Um, and improv, uh, you know, having the same gift for improvisation as the musicians that they serve is a really beautiful thing. Um, but ultimately, it's it's part of, it is part of a larger question, just with anything um, about paying now or paying later. And prevention is always worth. Uh, it, it's always a better investment than the cure. The same thing goes for housing. You know, it's way more expensive to take somebody off the street and put them back into a house and and rebuild a life than it is to keep them in a house all along. And so this is obviously part of a larger question of like, here we are in late stage capitalism, like everything is falling apart around us. But, um, you know, I see organizations like this as, uh, you know, fire, firefighters, but then there are also these other systems that are so much bigger than us that are making the fuel and throwing all these obstacles in our way. So there's, it's not, I, I look forward to um, the moment when we are able to elect more forward-thinking leadership um, because ultimately these organizations for touring musicians, they can only help you when you're at home and we're on the road most of the year, you know, a lot of times in other countries, you know, so if I'm in Australia, like I buy out of my own pocket, you know, when we go on tour, um, uh, travel insurance. Mm-hmm. didn't have to do that, but I do just in case, you know, something happens in another country and it sets me back a couple of hundred bucks each tour. Like I'm usually paying like one or two gigs worth of pay just to make sure that I'm um, covered. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's such a risky, risky thing, but it is. And now navigating the healthcare system, that's another thing that is so uh, crucial. I have a master's degree and my wife is pregnant right now and it has been hell trying to deal with Kaiser Permanente and just how little they'll pay, how much they hide things and try, you know, the, the insurance companies are part of the problem. So it, it's such an essential service. I don't know how to keep on saying that. You shouldn't have to do it, 
but it's there. I, the only way I see out of it is, is to have a universal healthcare system and then private hospitals for rich people who want extras. You know, we, we deserve that. But until that, every city needs something like this because without it, the music, musicians are going to fall through the cracks. And culture bears too. I think that the umbrella needs to be widened. You know, it's not just people on stage, but people who are mixing, people who are doing lighting, um, because it we all we're all uh, part of this creative team that makes you know the spectacle work. So, Martine, I'm going to broaden out a tiny bit, and I'm going to flatter you so you can turn your video off so you don't blush or whatever. But you know, I think not to be you know pedantic or sanimonious about this stuff, you, you know, the people who are involved in, in today's session, the people who do this work, we do this to be in service to people like you. Because what you bring and what Antibalas brings and what your other musical you know, outlets bring to us is unspeakable joy and catharsis and empathy. And I have had unbelievable moments and many of the people, again, who are watching today have had moments, you know, benefiting from your and your colleagues, not just you, but, you know, the creativity of what you bring, you know, to, to performance, to recordings. And again, Alex has put some links up in the, um, in the chat to the new Antibalas record, which you all should download on Bandcamp and, and, and enjoy that. And, and some of the other stuff that Martine is involved in, but, you know, we need to keep the focus of this conversation on the role that, like, what are we asking of you? You know, and again, not to personalize it, not what is Michael asking of Martine, but what are we as, as, as human beings asking from our musicians, especially to help us navigate a time of extraordinarily, um, extraordinary sort of anxiety and grief and mourning without the ability to, to have access to the traditional tools that we gravitate towards, especially in communities like New Orleans, you know, to mourn. And then we're putting that, on you collectively, not Martine, but collectively on artists to say, okay, we want y'all to figure out how to do some live streaming and we want y'all to have some sort of super creative presence to help, you know, entertain us and help us process this period. And then, oh, by the way, we want you to go out and start playing live music again. And we're not exactly sure what the rules are going to be or if it's going to be safe, but we want you to get back out on the road. And I think that this is all, again, this is why we structured today's conversation because we wanted to really highlight that we've had structural inequality and structural inadequacies in terms of the relationships between musicians and healthcare, as I said, for decades. And as we move into the next stage of this thing, we need to be really mindful of like, what are we asking our musicians and not just the artists themselves, but the crew, you know, the lighting techs, the people who work in venues, the people who work in bars, what are being asked of them and how do we make sure that they are held up in the front of the conversation in terms of like, who are the people that, that we really need to make sure feel like they can sign off on this? And, you know, could you, I, I know you all potentially, I mean, you, you all may have had a bit of the, of the thing, right? When you're finishing up your last tour, is that, you think you may have? Yeah, we're, we're in an album cycle right now that's been interrupted. Uh, we put out a new record, our seventh record in 22 years of being a band on Daptone label out of Brooklyn, New York, our, our family label. And um, we started uh, Florida right around when I heard about the first cases at the end of um, January was kind of when it hit my radar. And then we did a whole West Coast tour, um, California. We did three days in the Bay Area, had a couple days off, and I stayed at home to do some teaching uh, in the off days. And the band drove in the bus up to Seattle. And during that time, four people got really, really sick on the bus. Um, we weren't sure if it was COVID or just a bad flu or a cold, but that was how we wrote, you know. So, you know, we just, <laughs> it's like 13 people on a, no, 14 if, if you include the driver, wiping everything down, sleeping with our curtains closed, you know, all sorts of people had these little essential oil vaporizers, you know, just everything wiped them. You know, we went through so many paper towels. It was kind of horrible, but um, it was scary, you know, being on the road and then also just playing and knowing, just trying to put every ounce of what we had into being well for the, you know, 120 minutes that we were on stage yeah. and not really knowing what we could do because you can't really stop. 
you know, when you're on the road, there's all these people depending on you. And that kind of plugs into the economic piece. The reason why you can't stop is because there are so many people, not just depending on you, the fans, but it's like if the band doesn't show up, then the bartender doesn't get paid. The promoter doesn't get paid. The person who runs the parking lot next to the club doesn't get paid, you know? So we are, artists are an economic engine, you know, but we haven't seen a real increase in pay since 2007 because our expenses have gone up faster. Like we get, people pay us more as a band in 2019 than they did in 2017, but our, our uh, expenses, our overhead is that much higher. Um, so now it's hard to imagine because when I talk to our manager, agent, other club owners, talent buyers, the guarantees, at least for the next couple of years, are pretty much over. So bands are going to have to travel. Like once we say that things are safe, touring bands are going to show up and not know what they're going to make at all, even if they've been in the game for 20 years and pack that club for the past 20 years. You know, they might get 100. So the amount of risk that we're expected to, and, and that's before we even talk about the health risks. Right. So when people are saying reopen live music, what they're expecting musicians to bear financially, health-wise, it's, it's unreasonable. You know, we were, we were living such a precarious existence before this that to go back into it both economically and with regards to health, if there are not standards. So both of those things, the health piece that these are healthy venues that when we show up and sound check, hang out for the five hours between sound check and the gig, and then perform and then, you know, sell t-shirts, records, meet our fans afterwards, that all of that, you know, there's, there's little to no uh, room for transmission and whatever risk is there, that we're all on the same page about it, that we're not, assume, we're not bringing someone into something that they didn't sign up for, yep. you know, nor are we saying, giving anyone false hope that this is like, oh yeah, this room is totally cool. Nothing can happen. And right now, you know, as of yesterday, we get together and have these band conversations on Zoom every Thursday. Um, our musicians are like, hell no, I'm not setting foot in a club right now. Not tomorrow, not next week. Um, I'll play outside. You know, like we want to play more than ever. <laughs> we want to perform. But, um, you know, at what cost? And um, so that, you know, that needs to be, that needs to be worked out and yeah. I'm happy to be here, you know, but I think all of those things, you know, outlining from, we show up at a club, a lot of times we're in these places for 14 hours, you know, right. sometimes if you roll up the night before and your tour bus is outside, they open up at 10 a.m. so you can use the toilets and shower and blah, 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 you know, so sometimes we're at these clubs for 20 hours right. all around and a big band is creeping into a corner to find where they can practice. So almost every square, we, before the show starts, we could potentially be in every square inch of the club, right. you know? Um, and that's a lot to ask. That's a lot to ask. But, you know, for things to reopen, like, I'm, I'm not going to kill myself to be... <laughs> uh, people are going to start finding new income or it's going to privilege certain types of acts. You know, right. someone who doesn't sing, a DJ that can wear a mask all night, you know, or instrumental music or smaller format things or... You know, what I hope the kind of um, silver lining is that uh, more local scenes pop up, right. you know, and different cities figure out um, what works for them as far as outdoor concerts, um, what is safe. But I think it's we're going to see a real reshuffling of everything. And I really hope that we can get back out on the road because it's it's heartbreaking. But uh, mm -hmm. Even the fact that after 20 years, like I'm in West Coast, we got a couple guys West Coast, a guitarist in New Orleans, and then everyone else is in New, in New York. So right. even, to, and there's 12 of us, so we can't even really legally, safely get together to do streaming stuff right now. So that, that makes it, you know, we're going through that right now too. So I think, you know, putting, this, putting aside that it would be cool to see your version of the Dead Mouse thing. I mean, maybe there's, there's going to be the, resurgence of creative mask wearing DJs. That's, that's kind of an interesting thought, but I think, you know, beyond that, just to echo some of what you're saying and, and what we're hearing in a lot of our revs conversations as our pilot cities are starting to do their collaborative work. I mean, this notion of transparency and accountability is critical. And, and again, it's going to be critical for the musicians to have agency in terms of 
what do they need to see? And they can't be passive in that conversation and just wait to see, all right, what are we, what are you saying to us? It's got to be a no. And, and, and we have, you know, I think that there's some precedent in terms of, you know, writers, and, and this is, this goes well beyond a writer, but in terms of a contract or a document or a, a sort of, you know, accountability structure that basically says, this is what we're expecting. And mm-hmm. if you're not providing this, then, you know, uh, and, and in one of our revs meetings earlier this week, someone had the great, someone, one of our, our team members is, is a, is a, has a lot of experience as a um, tour manager and he said he's kind of anticipating, you know, the band pulls in and the tour manager is going to be wanting to get, you know, see all the checklist on the venue side and the venue is going to want to see it from the band side. Like, you know, are they all, you know, kind of meeting what they need to be in terms of their own health checks and things like that. So this, again, this level of collaboration is going to be neat. You know, it's going to be a, a new level of partnership and collaboration and trust. And then to take it to the next stage. And, and, and I know that you're fundamentally you know, you're an optimistic human being. Obviously, you have to be to survive in the, in the music community. And it's hard to think of an Antibalas, you know, show with dance pods where people can't move outside their five feet. And I mean, it, it, it's kind of a terrifying thing to think about. And we've had artists in, 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 in our interview program talk about, like, I don't want to play to a room full of people wearing masks. I mean, there's a lot of things that's hard to kind of get our head around. Yeah. But I also think that, you know, again, this is an opportunity to think structurally about, again, the economics of the live music industry and, and to fundamentally ask these questions, which really aren't up to you to solve. Like, you know, we collectively in the community have to say, is there value for us, for a band like Antibalas to be able to thrive in music at all? You know, I mean, we know there's a market. We know people come to your shows. We know people buy your albums. We know, we know, we know. We also know even before COVID, it didn't really fit into the economic structures of the community as they were defined. And so we've got to fix that. And that's on us. You know, that's on the collective community to say, what can we do? Where do we have opportunities to rethink the economic relationships to say, okay, if we want there to be, you know, a 12 or 13 piece, you know, Afrobeat ensemble, you know, that's like changing, blowing people's minds and changing the world, then we've got to figure out what those work, how those work. So anyway, um, so Martin, I'm I, just a last kind of closing question. And, and it's again, the impossible question and, and you may not have a, an answer. And so you can punt, uh, you know, and you have every right to punt, but I mean, you know, so again, you mentioned that you're, you and Courtney are expecting congratulations. You have life changes ahead. You've got career things happening. You've got a lot on your plate. You know, as you think about the next six months, what is that? you know, what does that look like? And what are the things that you need to see as a business person, as an artist, as a human being that are going to make you feel comfortable? What are the benchmarks that you need to see before you even start to think about, you know, getting the machinery geared up again? Uh, let's see. Wow. Punt. Thanks. And, for that. Well, no, I mean, that was the thing I, I hadn't even thought, you know, I was, th- I was thinking like, oh, you know, we just make the masks or the new concert t-shirt. And part of that is cool, but then I'm like, man, enough, that's why I go on stage is so I can see people smile. Right. And because at least the type of music that we play, there is an emotional feedback loop that happens between us and the audience. And I think most groups worth their salt, and even anyone who's made comics, you know, that's what we live for. That's what the stage is. And it's this, you know, kind of this invisible ping pong that goes back of joy. You know, and that is literally, you know, you can't, you can't see, you hope, and maybe it, it might lead to new forms of expression. Maybe people become better dancers or they shake their heads a lot. I don't know. But, I, you know, right, we've been wired as human beings to like this part of our face. A smile is a smile. You know, when people sing along, how can you tell that people are singing back if you can't see their mouths? So I think we're going to be a ways away from it. Um, Personally, as a band, uh, we're trying to figure, just navigate all these new platforms, both for asynchronous communication, like, is it possible to make a really good record when we're not all in the same room? Um, And then for performance stuff, can we pull off this acapella, you know, like the different multi-frame window stuff? And is that even worth, you know, 
other than entertaining somebody for 30 seconds and letting them know we're all still alive. Like that has nothing to do with what we do. It's pulling to do one of those things really well pulls us away from our core mission. Yep. You know, so I think part of it is us figuring out like, where is our time best spent and then wellness and then figuring out like, what are we all going to do when unemployment runs out at the end of July? So um, we're looking at Patreon. We're, we're just getting together. Cause this is like, there's a lot of stuff that we like busy work that we could be doing right now to be like, Oh yeah. You know, like I've done a YouTube live thing from my studio. That's like a kind of one man band thing. A couple of us are doing that just to stay creative um, to learn the platforms and see whether they could be some way to establish a connection with our fans and at least um, develop new income streams. But, um, you know, I know, not speaking for my band per se, but there are certain groups that that were really doing, you know, had a lot of momentum that this, you will probably never see or hear of them again after this, you know? Uh, there's probably gonna be a lot of young people who are that that come out of this. I mean, that's the thing. It's like a really big fire, yes. um, and certain kinds of seeds. You know, like the what is it? The pinole, in um, it's one of the pine, California pine trees that gives you pine nuts. But those seeds um, really can only take root after a seriously intense fire. So the optimist in me, you know, music is never gonna die. But I think music, as we have no come to love and know it is it's not going to be the same for a while and if it is there's going to be a lot of bad you know I, there's definitely going to be some underground stuff and and like the rebel in me the pirate radio person in me is like fuck yeah get together and do it you know on the other hand it's like how many people are going to show up in the icu two weeks after that you know do we really really want that um and it's a shame that so few of our it, I think we should really look back to the 80s, you know, when AIDS was happening, because part of it <laughs> was really dangerous, but some people were still out trying to live their best lives. And they're like, you know, the, the, there were some bad decisions that were made when people could have, you know, protected themselves better and exposed innocent people. And I don't want to be part of that, period, you know, as a musician. That's not what we're, that's completely counter. And I think most musicians are like that. And anybody who's willing to get to the stage really quickly, beware. Um, to talk about positives, I mean, I've seen some, uh, my friend, uh, friends in the band Delhi to Dublin up in Vancouver, they did a really cool uh, driving concert. They had these beautiful LED panels behind them. Um, everybody was in their cars and it was like 40 or 50 cars. It wasn't a ton. Um, they had some beautiful drone footage. People were so, like it really touched their heart. So. I see stuff like that happening, but those are stopgap measures. Like the future, that's totally not sustainable to have drive-in concerts, you know? So the Zoom things, the drive-in things are cool for right now to stay up and to let people know we still care about you. We're still creative. We want to share something with you, but nobody can make a living off of that. That's not a livelihood, you know? And nor do we want to go back to venues where they're operating at 30% capacity in order to make the same amount of money we got to charge a hundred dollars a ticket. Who's got, who's going to have that after this, you know? And even with a lot, I'm so I'm interested in like the lottery systems of maybe everybody pays $2 for a lottery ticket. And somehow the, some of that gives the band what they need also provides for the club to take care of all of the, you know, check off all the disinfectants and all that stuff. Um, but there also needs to be, uh, federal funds to make sure that these buildings that are going to gather people that are economic engines, that, that these small club owners, you know, at the clock out is not having to borrow like $200,000 to get a new ventilation system and UV blah, blah, blahs. And, you know, like, but this is, you know, this could be part of the green new deal. That's the other thing is that every venue needs some renovations, you know, the toilet leaks, or there's no toilet or there's, you know, so again, the opera, the, uh, the optimist in me is, is like, okay, you know, mm, there's, there's a lot of opportunities to rebuild this in a, in a very new way, or maybe we just, you know, there's more outdoor concerts that are happening or this. Well, Martin, thank you as always. I mean, no, just so it's always talking with you. And, and again, you know, your career arc 
and you're, you know, Ark is a human being. I mean, just, you've lived through so much of this and, you know, you've seen Brooklyn, you've seen Austin, you know, you've, you, you understand music ecosystems better than most You understand touring. I mean, you know, you've got the big picture and, and again, you know, I think all of us, you know, who are participating, you know, in these programs are all focused on what can we control? You know, how do we make a difference? What's the incremental work that we can be doing to kind of lead towards what could be transformational down the road? And, and again, that's not for everybody. And I think a lot of people are just, you know, I mean, if, if, if their response to this is to be checked out, that's completely fair. If their response, I mean, whatever, you know, I mean, it, it, everybody's approaching this from, um, you know, whatever place they, they need to come from, you know, but, but um, I just loved, and I know everyone participating today, loved hearing your perspective and, and can't wait for you to be back on the road when it's safe and uh, when it feels right and when the ticket price is appropriate and all those things are, I, I don't want to see the Gantic Ballas show where it's 300 bucks a ticket and it's me and 79 people who are paying 300 bucks a ticket. I'll just leave it at that. So, um, so we're going to wrap uh, again today's program. And again, huge thanks to all of our guests uh, for, for sharing their really remarkable work and, and, and their vision and their passion. Huge thanks as always to Alexander Dolvin for producing uh, the program. The YouTube link will be going up uh, this weekend. So if you enjoyed this interview and want to share it, um, you know, please share it with your friends or post on your socials. We'll be back next Friday with another edition of Music City Together Live. Uh, hit us up with questions, ideas, suggestions, thoughts at musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. And I hope everybody has a safe and pleasant weekend. Music.